Hey, y'all, it's only 1034. Ah! Got my movie sweater on. My popcorn. And drink. And it's got tickets and the movie reel. Had it 100 years. We're at school. All right, let me get to the right spot. I not remember where I was. Ah, let's see, let's see. Hmm. Okay, once he locates the goat, okay, you put it. Jowl man, <laughs> Silas. Just put on his rose tinted lenses so he could see uh, Ghost Ma. Uh, Isadora, it was generous. I'm going back over what I had read, but this is towards the end. Generous of Lillian to leave her funds to a worthy cause since she has fallen out with her family. You, on the other hand, should be grateful that you were able to share your wealth with your granddaughter. Not all families are able to repair the wounds of time. Graham's unnaturally youthful visage is fraught with indecision. I don't have time for this detour. Silas, you have to get me into that house. I know one of those kids is responsible for killing Vasily, and I'm sure that if I can get access to the house, I'll get a feeling. And how would you propose I accomplish that? You met each and every one of the family members aboard last night's gambling boat memorial service. I should hardly think they would welcome you into their estate. <clears throat> I could be your assistant. I'll wear a disguise. I run to the closet and yank open the deep bottom drawer of the large built-in units. As I rifle through the wigs, I shout, Grams? Mousy Brown, I want to blend in. What do you think? Despite her existential feud, she can't resist an undercover operation. She bursts through the wall of the closet and makes a beeline for the tailored suits. Definitely Mousy Brown. Pull it back in a loose ponytail and we'll need to find you some thick glasses. Check in that top drawer over there with the gloves. What's she doing with thick glasses for the height of fashion? I follow her instructions while she piles through the skirt suits. Tortoise shell rims are black. She turns and puts a, a hand on her ample hip. Let me see both. Silas shuffles into the doorway and tilts his head. This appears to be a drill you two have rehearsed before. However, I made no mention of an assistant when I accepted this engagement. Well, call and let them know if it's so important. In my experience, assistants are always forgotten. It would be more believable if you just show up with me. They won't even notice me. Silas smooths his mustache and nods thoughtfully, perhaps. I shoo him out of the closet. I got to change. Give me five minutes. And give me just a few. I always I wash these glasses with the actual cleaner and the right little cloths. I've got a teeny million of them. Maybe four or five. I do go on, don't I? Let's see here. Five minutes. Slipping into the possibly drab, positively drab gray suit and cream blouse that Grams has selected for me, I'm frankly surprised to see something so basic in her closet. Basic? Has the meaning of that word changed? Is that an insult? I'll scold you for thought dropping later. Expertly tugging on the wig, I push all my white hair up underneath and secure it with some bobby pins. Now show me the glasses. Tortoise shell? I pull them off and put on the other pair. Or black? Definitely the black. Oh, and those exceedingly oh, cheek fake leather pumps. That definitely completes the fade into the background ensemble she giggles 
I pushed the glasses on and slipped my feet into the black pump, strutting twice around the closet. I asked, what do you think? Is this scream assistant or what? The suit screams assistant, but the sassy personality inside is way too confident, dear. You're going to have to work on being demure and unassuming. Sassy? Rude. Glaring at my ghostly critic, I'm eager to prove her wrong. Outside the closet, I hear Silas chuckling openly. I step out with my hands gripped at my waist, rubbing my thumbs together nervously, staring at the ground. I mumble in a soft, whispery voice with a hint of a lisp. Yes, Mr. Willoughby, right away, Mr. Willoughby. This performance brings a fresh set of belly laughs to my alchemist attorney. His face reddens dangerously, and his jowls jiggle like little bags full of jelly. <laughs> Take a deep breath, Silas. It's not permanent. It's only for today. He leans back with a hand on his round paunch and struggles to take a deep breath. Then this day shall be the single greatest in my personal history, oh, brother. I roll my eyes mercilessly behind my stage prop eyewear. Do I need a briefcase or a, or a clipboard? Silas appraises my outfit. You, de you do indeed look the part. I tell you what, I shall allow you to carry my briefcase. Glory be, I raise my hands in false praise. Silas heads toward the secret door and I follow without being asked. He presses the intricate plaster medallion, and as the, as the door slides open, Ghost of My cries out, What's your name? Grams, are you all right? I'm Mitzi. You know my name. You know what she's talking about. Got my tea. Before she can reply, Silas interjects, not the overstep, and I realize I did not hear the actual query, but could your grandmother possibly have meant a reference to your cover identity? Oh, right, let's see. I've used Daisy and Darcy. How about Dora? Dora seems like an unmemorable name, right? Dory. She don't listen to this. Graham's chuckles. Well, I suppose not to someone actually named Dora, but it'll work. Last name? I don't think it's right for Silas to refer to, assist, to his assistant by her first name. Donaldson? Dora Donaldson? Silas nods. Follow me, Miss Donaldson. It's only when we step out the front door of the bookshop that I realize I'll have to ride into Model T. <laughs> Not the pinnacle of comfort or speed. Begrudgingly, I climb into the mint condition, 1908 Model T. The seats so show some wear, and the steering wheel has two smooth indentations that cradle his hands. But other than that, the vehicle looks like it rolled off the assembly line yesterday. And that was all of six. And I was sleepy and parched. So chapter seven. Smash cut to the imposing perimeter of the Barnes estate. We reach the black iron gates that loom over our vehicle. And a large shield spanning both halves of the gate bears a latin phrase that i don't recognize no it says smash no cut to but whatever i guess some of her film lingo no our shield span i don't recognize silas presses the intercom and announces our arrival as the gates swing open. I ask, what does that Latin gibberish mean? Latin is not gibberish, Ms. Dora Donaldson, Silas, Miss Donaldson. Indeed, Miss Donaldson. And then he says the uh, thing in, in Latin, divide and conquer. What a horrible family motto. No wonder they all hate each other. 
The long drive travels through manicured lawns trimmed and snipped to within an inch of their lives. When we pull up in front of the grand entrance, a doorman steps out, holds the door with a gloved hand, and stands absolutely still, refusing to make any eye, eye contact as we mount the stairs. Before we make it through the doorway, I'm hit with a thick odor of stale tobacco smoke. Thank you for smoking at the local dive bar. Final destination smells better than this. Inside the great hall opens onto a vast black and gray marble floor with a seven-tiered crystal chandelier dominating the high ceiling. A grand staircase, carpeted in a deep red, opens before us and divides in opposite directions at the first landing. On that landing stands a man I don't recognize from the viewing or the memorial cruise. Good morning, Mr. Willoughby. So good of you to come. Please follow me to the library. Silas and I climb the stairs, and I take the opportunity to whisper under my breath. See, no mention of the assistant. Silas harumps, but makes no reply. I'm Mr. Everett, the executor. We spoke on the phone. How good to meet you, Mr. Everett. Upon reaching the second floor, we marched down a lengthy hallway adorned with stunning artwork. My mentor never misses an opportunity. Miss Donaldson, allow us to slow our pace. This is a rare treat. He gestures to the individual masterpieces, Matisse, Rousseau, and Immaculate Cezanne. And I'm probably screwing up these artist names. Those are both by Toulouse Lautrec, Van Gogh, and an unmistakable Paul Gugan. Sorry. He ceases his recitation and addresses our guide. Is the entire collection post impressionist? Ah, yes, you have a keen eye. Mr. Everett nods his admiration. I stare and wonder at the works. I mean, the frames alone seems as though they'd be worth a fortune. In addition to the paintings and sketches, there's a full suit of armor. In the hallway, several marble busts and even a marble statue of the Madonna and Child. The fascinating art show ends as we walk through a gilded archway into a library three times the size of Mr. Willoughby's and nearly as large as the bell, book, and candle. Violet Roman, Iris, and her husband sit on the opposite side of a massive oak table, each of them looking much the worse for wear. Violet still has streaks of smeared mascara under her eyes and her plump skin is an unhealthy ashen ashen hue. Roman is smoking and the ashtray in front of him would indicate he's mowed through half a pack waiting for our arrival. He certainly bears some portion of the responsibility for the wretched smell clinging to the walls. Although I can't believe he's allowed to smoke near such priceless artwork. Iris does not look up. Her hands continue to fidget in her lap while her husband tightens the protective arm already around her muscular shoulders. <clears throat> this is honestly the first time I've taken any notice of the husband. He's much older than his late 30s bride, has obvious hair plugs, and his eyes scream we've been tucked one too many times. Mr. Everett gestures to two of the rolling wooden chairs on our side of the table. Please have a seat. Do you care for water, Mr. Willoughby? I'm about to mention that I'd like some water, but I remember I'm a mousy, unassuming assistant and wisely keep my mouth shut. Silas or the wind. Yes, two waters would be most appreciated, Mr. Everett. The executor gestures to a servant who's been standing in the corner and let's be honest, had completely escaped my notice. Notice. He then opens his thick leather folio and begins going over the ex extraordinarily boring preamble to Lillian's will. I won't reread the personal gifts and family heirlooms. There shall be no change. 
in those bequests. However, the estate, the art collection, the grounds, the vineyards, and all of Lillian's liquid assets are to be divided 30-70 between the Queen of Heaven, Pet Cemetery, and the Penn Cherry Harbor Animal Shelter. Roman throws his half-smoked cigarette on the carpet and shoves his chair back in anger. Violet screams and stamps out the cigarette butt. Iris turns and buries her head in her husband's chest as her shoulders shake with sobs. Her sorrow has nothing to do with her departed mother. My, my special gifts indicate her anguish is 110% in response to the loss of her her inheritance. Roman st storms out of the library, muttering unrepeatable epithets under his breath about his recently deceased mother, Euro trash and filthy animals, defecating on his birthright. Violet puts her hand over her tiny rosebud mouth, and even with the help of my extra senses, I can't quite tell if she's offended or about to be sick. She runs out whimpering. Mr. Everett takes it all in stride. Iris, do you have any questions for Mr. Willoughby? Just one. Her sharp features pinch in disdain. How can you live with yourself? Silas smooths his mustache and replies, Were you and your mother close, Mrs. Barnes Becker? Unfortunately for poor Iris, she has no idea who she's dealing with, but I have the advantage of knowing that when Silas answers a question with a question, he's about to serve up a lesson. Mr. Becker steps in to defend his wife. I'm not sure what business it is of yours. It may, in fact, not be my business, Mr. Becker. However, your wife asked me a question, and I feel I'm duty-bound to respond. Iris stares quizzically at Silas. Everyone in this town knows my mother and I had a falling out. That doesn't mean she has the right to cut me out of the wheel. I paid my dues. I was born in this house, grew up in this house, endured her endless insults in this house. I deserve compensation. This time she makes no attempt to hide her tears. Silas nods compassionately. I wonder, would you have any interest in serving on the board of the Penn Cherry Harbor Animal Shelter? Her head snaps up and my initial read of her energy pulses with negativity, but as a light flickers in her eyes, I can feel her whole essence shift. shift. I could do that. I like animals. Very well, I shall put a motion before the board at our next meeting. Perhaps you would entertain the use of the Barnes Manor as a permanent fundraising location for the shelter and other nonprofits in town. We would, of course, require a full-time caretake, caretaker to live... <coughs> On the property and see to the day-to-day -day affairs here, this position would come with compensation. He's helping her out. For a split second, Iris emits a flicker of pleased energy, which rapidly shift to shifts towards guilt. I'd like to know if that guilt is solely connected to her affair with the Vasily. Or if there's more to it, time to snoop. I lean toward Silas and whisper, I need to use the restroom, Mr. Willoughby. He nods. Mr. Everett, would you be kind enough to point my assistant toward the nearest lavatory? Of course. Follow me, miss. Stepping out of the library, he gestures down the long hallway. And then you'll make a left, go down three doors, and the Cyril and bath will be on your right. Bowing my head in an, in an awkward partial curtsy, I shuffle down the hall, turn the corner, and once I'm out of sight, lean up against the wall next to the marble bust of Shakespeare on a pedestal. I whisper into the stone ear of the somewhat disputed king of tragedies, 
Violet and Roman are not going to be happy when they find out about the deal that Iris struck. And before I can enter the bath, an icy chill sweeps down the corridor and goosebumps rise on my arms. All of my senses, the regular and the extra ones, are on high alert. I dive into the bathroom and close the door. But right behind me, something burst through the door, and I mean through the door, through the closed door. Lillian? The swirling mist coalesces and definitely resembles the woman whose face I saw in the casket a little more than 24 hours ago. You can see me? Apparently, she exhales dramatically and fans herself with one hand. Fantastic, darling. I'll have a dry martini, dirty, two olives. You know you can't actually drink a martini, right? Don't lecture me. I'm Lillian Barnes. If I can have a martini delivered to the top of the Eiffel Tower, I can certainly have one in my own home. Now scoot. I mean you can't drink a martini because you're dead. I cross my arms and raise one eyebrow. How inconvenient, darling. Are you sure? Positive. We'll bump that up to your supervisor later. At least someone can see and hear me. Now we get to, now we can get to the bottom of things. Get to the bottom of what? My murder, of course. Eight. <laughs> I have my tea. And I'm somewhat awake. A small portion of my shock and awe can be attributed to seeing a ghost other than Grant's. But the majority is hanging on this one's last words. I'm sorry, you're what? My murder, are you hard of hearing as well as poorly dressed? I sincerely hope this ghost can't hear my thoughts because I'm starting to get a real feel for why our children are estranged. Oh, I heard you, except according to the official report, you died of natural causes. There was no autopsy and no suspicion of foul play, and your family physician said you had a long history of emphysema and died in your sleep of res respiratory complications. Lillian crosses her arms haughtily and scoffs. You seem to have a lot of information for a lowly assistant. What's your story? Shrugging my shoulders, I dive in. Since there's not a lot of people... You can tell. I'll give it to you straight, Mrs. Barnes. I'm a psychic. I'm Isadora Duncan's granddaughter. The grand dame of <laughs> Barnes Manor sighs and rolls her eyes, of course. Even in death, that woman is spying on me. Ignoring her poke at my family tree, I continue. As I was saying, I inherited her bookshop, and I'm a pretty good amateur sleuth. I'm actually here undercover investigating Vasily's murder. This information rocks her world, and the all-too-familiar translucent ghost te tears that leak from her eyes. Translucent ghost tears that leak from her eyes. Give me a surge of guilt. Sorry, I thought you would know. Isn't his ghost on the other side with you? She angrily swipes her tears away and once again looks down her ethereal nose at me. For a psychic, you don't seem to know very much about the afterlife, darling. Clearly, I'm trapped here in this mansion. Because I have unfinished business, I had no idea my gorgeous facility had crossed over, poor little lamb. There's way too much time to unpack in that tirade, so I choose to back up. 
So I choose to back up to the information that's actually important. We can debate the finer points of extrasensory perception at a later date. You claim you were murdered? What evidence do you have and why should I care? Her eyes wide and obviously she's not used to being spoken to as an equal. Uh, excuse me. Itch. The cheek of you. Do you have any idea who I am? I'm not this ghost down a peg. Of course I do. You're the utterly powerless ghost of a woman who lived her life so completely self-involved that none of her three children even mourned her passing. Powerless, eh? Lillian swirls into an angry mist and surges toward me. I instinctively put my hands up over my face as if that can stop a ghost from passing through me, but after a moment of anticipation, with no consequences, I crack open my eyelids and peer around the bathroom. Lillian? Or Lillian? Was there going to be a demonstration? A whimpering sound causes me to turn toward the tub, and there, sulking on the edge of the enormous blue glass bathtub, is the defeated ghost of Lillian Barnes. You're right. You're absolutely right. I'm utterly powerless. I've tried to move objects, tried to leave this place, tried to frighten my children, but no one can see me. I can't move anything. I can't intimidate anyone. It's difficult for me to imagine my greatest regret after death being the end. <laughs> oh, gosh. Sorry. The inability to intimidate someone, but far be it from me to want to live in this poor woman's world. Look, I'm sorry to be so harsh. If you really were murdered, I'll absolutely help you. It's my kind of thing. I lean down and attempt to pat her shoulder. She jerks away. What are you doing? Apparently making the horrible mistake of attempting to comfort you. Why would you be kind to me? I learned the hard way that everyone deserves a second chance. Plus, I lost my mom when I was 11, and I actually loved her. Lillian brushes her bleached gray-blonde hair back from her face. I may have made a few mistakes as a mother, but I amassed a fortune and a singular collection of fine art, not to mention I still hold the record for most ex-husbands north of the Mason-Dixon. <laughs> There's no time for all the counseling this diva needs. Let's try to stay on topic. I've got to get back to the library before they start to think there's something seriously wrong with my digestive tract. <laughs> Understand that. Why do you think you were murdered? Simple, darling. I woke up to grab a ciggy and found a pillow smashed over my face. I struggled and thrashed, but whoever was shoving the pillow down was stronger than me. He or she just kept pushing that pillow tighter and tighter until I couldn't get any air in my there's no need to finish. I believe you, Lillian, but I need more time to search the house, question your children, look into your affairs. How did you know I was having an affair? <laughs> having a what now? Oh, you were referring to my financial affairs. Never mind. <laughs> Note to self, this family is full of leechers. And did she say a cigarette with emphysema? Unbelievable. I need more time. How do I get back into the house legitimately? What day is it? Saturday. Why? She swirls around the bathroom, fluffing her hair and dabbing a finger under each eye. Let's see. Tomorrow is Sunday. Oh, upstairs maid has Sundays off, darling. Show up tomorrow at 8 a.m. Come in through the servant's entrance and take a maid's uniform from the closet. You'll have free access to the house for at least eight hours. Sometimes upstairs maid works ten hours. That should give you enough time. This woman's a real piece of work. 
and no one will be suspicious that upstairs maid looks like a completely different person and came to work on Sunday. Oh, dear, you really are a blue-collar girl. No one even knows upstairs maid's name. I doubt very seriously they've noticed what she looks like. You'll be fine. Before this is all over, I will figure out how to punch a ghost squarely in the face. <laughs> Perfect. Looks like you found yourself a new upstairs maid. She checks her fingernails and sighs. I don't suppose you have any references. You can't be serious. <laughs> but one can't be too careful. <laughs> Listen, Lillian, I'm going to help you. And don't misinterpret that to mean I like you. I'd advise you not to push your luck with me. In the meantime, why don't you make yourself useful and listen in on any conversations that seem suspicious or secretive? You might not be be able to scare anyone. <clears throat> Poor you. But you can definitely eavesdrop, all right? How gauche. She wipes a manicured hand across her creaseless brow. If you insist, I do. Now I have to get back. Hurrying down the long hallway, which I'm nicknaming Passageway of the Masters, I find the library empty of Lillian's offspring. Silas raises one bushy eyebrow, and I suddenly shake, suddenly shake my head. Mr. Everett stands. Let me walk you out, Mr. Willoughby. You're too kind. Silas hands me his briefcase, and I take it with a sigh. <clears throat> we head back through the grand mansion down the wide carpeted staircase and across the polished marble floor i'll be in touch with iris about the board's decision such a generous offer mr willoughby perhaps more generous than she deserves Uh, despite the superficial gratitude of the statement, my Claire audience picks up an entirely different phrase. Mr. Everett is actually thinking that Iris is the least deserving and most conniving of the children. Silas opens the car door for me, taking a moment to suck down a gulp of fresh, non-ashtray scented air. I slip into the Model T and wait impatiently while he goes through the lengthy cranking startup process. Once we're trundling back toward Pin Cherry proper, I spill my story. So, Lillian was murdered. Her ghost is haunting the house, and she sort of hired me to solve the case. <laughs> <coughs> Silas laughs openly, and here I was assuming you were experiencing possible digestive discordance. For the record, she's as awful as everyone says. Silas grins. Not the first I've heard. He taps his thumb against the steering wheel. Will you be keeping me abreast of your plan? What makes you think I have a plan? He takes his eyes off the road long enough to blast me with a scathing look. All right, there's a plan. I fill him in on the details as we drive to the bookshop. He turns down the alleyway between the Duncan Restorative Justice Foundation and my bookstore. My apologies, but I'm unable to stay, Mitzi. I must complete my correspondence to the bequeathed charities. <coughs> <clears throat> before the end of the day you'll bring your grandmother up to speed of course i'm sure she'll want me to run a subversive mission to gather dirt on lillian while i'm in the enemy's camp i chuckle as i exit the vehicle silas leans across silas leans across and his wise milky blue eyes Fix me with an unreadable gaze. Your grandmother may yet surprise you. And with that, he reverses out of the alley and disappears. 
Twiggy is nowhere to be found, and the chain is securely fastened across the bottom of the circular staircase. But to test my, but to test my theory, I unhook the chain. <coughs> Sorry. Step onto the first tread and wait. Silence. She's definitely not here. God, Lee. This must be circulating with fibers. I march into my apartment, struggling to remove the bobby pins and the now itchy wig. Grams. Grams, do you want to hear the plan or not? Another round of silence. Where is everyone? Doesn't she want to hear what I did? Kyle Wackett pushes himself to a seated position on the large four-poster bed and stretches one paw to the side, almost as though he's resting on his hip. Don't you want to hear what I did? My bladder control 101 training comes in handy, but I can't stop my jaw from dropping. Robin? Powacket, good fella, did you actually speak to me? He said that. He said that. Let me go back. Powacket pushes himself to a seated position on the large four-poster bed and stretches one paw to the side, almost as though he's resting it on his hip. Don't you want to know? Don't you want to hear what I did? Oh, Mitzi, you should have seen your face, dear. It's grams. My mouth is still hanging open, and I can't figure out what I'm seeing. Pie Wackett's head is bobbing back and forth, and his jaw is moving as though he's speaking to me. Grams, is that you? Are you working Pie Wackett like a ventriloquist dummy? In a manner of speaking, I think I've successfully possessed him. A shock ripples across my skin, and I can't believe what I'm hearing. Get out of that cat. You've completely crossed the line, Isadora. I bet they're going to be putting Pie Wackett in that shelter and finding out all kinds of stuff. That sentient animal can't give his a uh, consent, I rush toward Pie Wackett, and as soon as my left arm scoops around him and my magic mood ring touches his skin, the apparition of my grandmother bolts out of my precious fur baby. Pie Wackett cuddles against me, and I've honestly never seen him act so helpless or afraid. Grams, what's gotten into you? It's not like you to treat Pie Wackett so disrespectfully. Is something wrong? I mean, really wrong? She blows across the apartment like an angry, angry storm cloud and sinks into the scalloped back chair. <clears throat> Three more rejection letters today. What are you talking about? I feel like you've dropped me into one of those memento-style movies that use backward storytelling. To reveal the twist, who was rejected and from what? Or memoirs, I bet. She throws her head back and lays a misty forearm dramatically across her brow. The publishers, they rejected my memoirs. The hairs on the back of my neck spike. How would they even know about your memoirs? You didn't start writing them until after you were dead. She sighs and smooths the folds of her Marchesa gown. I wrote the query letters, dear. I sent out 30 in the last two or three months. I can't be sure. Time is so little, Nanny. You're writing letters from beyond the grave? Don't you think that's the reason you're getting rejected? If these publishers have half a brain, they would definitely look up the names of the author. Name of the author. Seeing that the author is dead, I'm assuming that's why they reject the manuscript. But I'd be happy to give it a read if you want some notes. Notes from a girl who barely has more than 20 years on this planet? I think not. You 
You do know what a life I've lived, right? Grams, this is so not you. I get that you're upset about the rejections, but you might have to send out a hundred letters or maybe even two hundred letters before you find the right publisher. They don't know who they're dealing with. I once had <clears throat> I once had a martini delivered to the top of the Eiffel Tower. The hands that were busily consoling Piwak at false steel. That's the second time I've heard that story today. I narrow my gaze and study ghost my guilty flash of self consciousness spins through my grandmother's translucent eyes. You don't say who else told you that story, Silas? The ghost of Lillian Barnes, and in her version, she ordered the martini. Graham's rockets across the room. What? Now she's a ghost? The, that woman will never get tired of imitating me. How she look? <laughs> Did she choose a younger age? Is she younger than me? Good grief. If I never see this side of you again, it'll be too soon. I roll my eyes far longer than necessary. Are you saying... She stole the story from you because I'm supposed to work at her mansion tomorrow and investigate her murder, so I'd kind of like to know if she's a con artist. Oh, she's a con artist. I think she's a little more than that. But I could never get absolute proof. Graham swirls around, lost in a fog of memories. Unfortunately, I have to interrupt. Is your story, is it your story or hers? Both. You're going to have to expand on that, Missy. I met Lillian back when the, uh, back when she was, I met, I don't know how to pronounce her name, Lillian, I guess. Back when she was Lillian, I've been calling her that sometimes too. While Max and I were drinking our way across Europe, you remember Max, dear, my second husband? I nod. I'm familiar. Well, Max and I were all about parties, booze, gambling, and buying our way into the upper crust across the pond. Lillian seemed to be a few steps ahead of us, and she took an immediately um, an immediate liking to Max. She invited us on to a yacht on the Mediterranean for a couple of weeks. And then we all headed to France via Italy. She would disappear for a few days here and there. And she mentioned she had a lot of family back in the States. She was always sending gifts and packages. But when we reached Paris, things came to a head. She pauses to collect her thoughts. <clears throat> Piwak it climbs onto my lap, spilling off either side of the ample platform. Everything started out glorious, as things always do in Paris. We stood at the top of the Eiffel Tower, and I mused about how fantastic it would be to sip martinis as the sun set. With a snap of her fingers, Lillian made it happen, and one martini led to five, and I woke up in the belly of a rowboat floating in the, I said the name of that river in France, Seine, with no sign of Max, Graham shakes her head. He turned up about an hour later, stinking of her expensive French perfume. He had espresso croissants and a sack full of excuses. She dusts her hands a couple of times as though she's brushing off some flour. That was the end of my friendship with Lillian, and it's ultimately what pushed me over the edge with booze and led to the accident that took Max's life and, as you know, one of my kidneys. You ran with quite a crowd, Isadora, yes, and at quite a cost. 
dear Max wasn't the love of my life, but he was wild, free, and oh, so handsome. And I'm unable to suppress a snicker, and we all know how sad it is when handsome people die. She picks up a coaster from the coffee table and hurls it teasingly in my direction. Mitzi, you're too much. Her laughter eases the tension and I go for the jugular. Grams, you owe Pie Wacket an apology. She slips across the room, tears streaming down her face, and kneels at the edge of the bed. Mr. Cuddlekins, can you ever forgive me? I had no right, and I'm deeply sorry for abusing of using your trust. Real. Thank you. I wouldn't have forgiven her so easily, Pie, but you're your own man. He bangs his head against my shoulder and curls affectionately. I ruffle his ear tufts. Now that everything's mended in our family, let's dive into that barn's disaster. Grams and I spend a few hours discussing the husbands, the siblings, the enemies, and the help, the possible suspects in both Murph cases. You better choose a new wig for tomorrow. <clears throat> I agree that people rarely notice the help, but I think something with bangs will seal the deal. Leave it to my frustrated writer of a grandmother to always expand <laughs> always expand the scene. What about the shoes? I definitely can't wear my high tops. And Lillian didn't mention anything about shoes in the servant's closet. Graham shakes her head and lifts, and lifts her hands helplessly. It's not the kind of thing I would buy. You might have to run to the mall in Broken Rock. Copy that. I give Pie Wackett's head one last playful scratch and grab some cash. Grab some cash off my nightstand. Someone will publish your memoirs, Grams. You're a fascinating woman. Twice the woman Lillian could ever be. Don't give up, all right? Uh, she floats towards me in the comfort of her non-corporal arms. Encircling me is indescribable. Indescribable. I love you, Grams. I love you too, dear. And that's all of chapter eight. Finish six, read seven and eight. What? In 47 minutes and 43 seconds. But wow, wow, wow. I like this book best of all. What y'all think? Cream's getting empowered. And another ghost. Oh my gosh. Love y'all. Be sweet. Don't be ugly. Hope to see you tomorrow, love. Bye.